Seamlessly talking about steep learning Seamless curves for the first thing. week. <laughs> Let's move to Doctor Who, shall we? Yeah. Morgan Undead. Presumably your first filming was uh, location stuff at the school and the obelisk yeah, and... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You've got, well, we won't go into how you got cast. You got cast. You're playing... You're 22 or 23 years old playing this unaged yeah, alien schoolboy. I was 23. Right. Think, yeah. And they made you dye your hair red. They did make my hair dye my hair red. Would you like to know the details? Yes, please. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sort of a cue, almost. When did we last see each other, Karen? Uh, nice idea. So even you will have forgotten some of my stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, no, I, oh. You know the Mr. Bid meet over there? Yes. <laughs> Hello, Chris. How are oh, you? See you? Lovely to see you, too. And you don't look a day old. <laughs> Neither do you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> No, so why, so interesting about why I have my hair red um, was that I looked like Peter Davison. No, this is true, <laughs> honestly. That, that they decided that on long shot, Peter and I would look the same. So it was when the camera's a long way away from you, we'd look the same. And, um, and, and Peter's hair was blondie, blondie and, and my hair was blondie. Um, it was actually blonder there because I lived in England where you have more sunshine than New Zealand. <laughs> and... Um, and so they said, Peter, John Nathan Turner, who was the producer, said, OK, Mark, we've had an idea. We'd like you to have all your hair cut off. And I, and I thought, well, you know, I, if you have all your hair cut off, you're instantly recognisable for starters, right? And I was aware that when you step into Doctor Who, you're going to be recognised on the street. It was a big programme in those days. It's even an even bigger programme now. But it was a big programme even in those days. So you thought, no, I don't really want to have all my hair cut off. And, um, and anyway, it was only a six-month contract to start off with, and how long does it take to grow your hair back? So, anyway. so I pointed out to John that you'd have to pay me for loss of earnings for the two months whilst I grew my hair back. <laughs> and at that time, when we were making Doctor Who on the smell of an oily rack, <laughs> this, this actually um, sort of um, put him in a bit of perspective. So I said, OK, let's dye your hair red. We'll cut it really short, and we'll dye it really, really ginger. And I said, well, that's fine. And... Um, and he said, it'll be, it'll be a washout dye. So you won't have problems, you know, being having this horrible, bright, bright red metallic alien hairstyle. Uh, so I said, that's fine. So, um, so I went into the first day's filming. And I went in at 6 o'clock in the morning, because you do, and I went into makeup, and they dyed my hair. Um, they cut it and dyed it, and that's how I was going to be as Turlo for the next three years. And that was fine, and I went home, and I got under the shower, and nothing washed out. <laughs> nothing! Like, there wasn't a trace of dye coming anywhere. And um, I woke up in the morning, and my pillow was completely, like, covered in this sort of red stuff. And that was the story of my life for the next three years. And it made me instantly recognisable, and children used to run away from me in the street, and... Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Having interviewed you long, long ago, I know that you found, <laughs> it does seem like a lifetime, I know you found the conditions of filming, and you were saying there was no money, and Chris was saying this earlier, yeah, you were working, you tough. found the conditions of filming to be tough sometimes, yeah. and I think the example perhaps you could, was Warriors of the Deep and the Silurians and the Sea Devils and Ten Well, no, there are lots and lots and lots, lots of stories. I mean, it wasn't a bad thing in any way. Um, um, I mean, we now make television in a very different world. Um, and in those days, we were essentially making television, although John was trying to change it for the UK domestic market. And we weren't thinking about international sales or any of those things, although John was, very cleverly. And if you want to thank anybody for saving Doctor Who, it's John Nathan Turner. Um, and so J John basically got the job as producer of Doctor Who. Doctor Who was going to be canned. And John got the job because he promised he could make it cheaper than they thought basically you could make that sort of television. And he did an amazing job um, in bringing it on budget, on time, every time. Um, he was a very disciplined man in, in those ways. Um, but that, that gave us enormous problems as writers, actors, producers, directors, everybody was stuck there that you literally had a certain amount of time to do stuff and a certain amount of money. So, that, you know, you couldn't be arty about it. It was get your job done. And for an actor, that meant know your lines, be on time, be ultra-reliable. That was what John was after. And, and I was all those things. Um, 
It was interesting. One of the reasons he cast me was because I'd been in Angels, and, and, and John's partner, Gary, had been a production manager on Angels and knew me. So I came with a sort of a good, good record on that front. It was frustrating sometimes, and it was very exciting in other ways. If you look, I've been asking people today which version of Enlightenment do they like, because amazing graphics on the new DVD of Enlightenment. But the graphics for one episode cost more than the whole of the budget for making the entire four episodes when we made it. Um, it was a, you know, we were, we, were, we were just doing a job and being actors and nobody was special and producers or directors weren't. No, but nothing was special. We were making telly and hoping to make good entertaining telly. And we all worked really hard and pushed it. But we'd come in at six o'clock in the morning into studios um, and we wouldn't finish till 10 o'clock at night. And sometimes, um, in those days, there were things called unions in the UK, <laughs> and the whole process was very regulated. And you'd go into the studio, and you would start at a certain time and finish at a certain time. And a little man would pull a big lever, and all the lights on Television Centre 1 would go out at 10 o'clock. And there was nothing you could do about that. You could negotiate 15 minutes. Um, but that was it. So you got into a situation where you're getting to the end of studios, and you'd have to do scenes faster, literally faster because you hadn't enough time to finish. And we couldn't afford a setup. So you've got all the sets up there, right? So we couldn't afford for all those sets to come back into Television Centre One. And I remember in my last story, um, 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 Planet of Fire, we were getting right to the end of the studio. Uh, Fiona Cumming was the director, and, and we had, I think, 48 seconds left in the studio. And she said, look, Mark, you've just got to get the plot lines in. Um, and we started, and I, I cut as I went and got the plot lines in. And if you want to watch it back, it's the scene where I go into the, into the derelict um, spacecraft when it's crashed and I talk to Tryon, which is a crucial scene <laughs> in it. And yet I didn't have enough time to get... I could only do the plot lines, I couldn't do the other lines. So I was like, it was like working on stage. I had... It was great because it was live and energetic and there was an enormous energy in Doctor Who at that time. Now there's a different energy, but you do get a second take if you want it and you get a third take if you want it. And we didn't, do, we didn't have that at all. So, you know, examples. Um, we, you know, um, Peter... The Merca, perhaps? Well, um, the, Mer the Merca's a good example. Um, um, the story... Um, what's the story called with the Merca? Warriors um, of the Deep. Warriors of the Deep. Uh, two, two examples from that, easy examples. Um, yeah, no, when we got into the studio, right, and because, again, because of budgets, the Merca was hanging up and literally dripping with paint. It wasn't dry. <laughs> but, you know, they obviously hadn't had time. We'd worked in the rehearsal rooms with the guys who did who were two, they were the head and the tail of a horse in a series at the time called Rent-A-Ghost. They were fantastic, and they were this pantomime horse, right? <laughs> they got into the Merca costume, and it was lowered down onto them, and they couldn't move. So, you know, where, where do you go from there? You've got a wet costume, which is too heavy for the actors to move. Um, and it sounds impossible, and yet when you look back at Warriors of the Deep, it's actually quite good. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's a great tribute to everybody who worked on it. Um, Janet, it was, Janet had to have the first scene, and she, it was a fight scene with the Merca, and she had to kick the Merca or something, and she got paint all over her. You know, that was tears before bedtime. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it, 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 it was very, very, very hard. Um, and you just had to make it up as you went. Uh, and it, if, you, if I could have taken you, and I'm sure Chris would say the same, if I could have taken you to a studio at that time, about, and, and you'd seen how it was filmed, you would never have believed it. It wasn't, I'm not saying it was mayhem, it wasn't mayhem. It was just very, very fast. And I came on from a soap opera into Doctor Who. And before I came on from Angels, this soap opera I was in, I came to a Doctor Who studio and I watched them filming and I thought, I'm never going to be able to do it. I was frightened. I was really, really frightened. Because it was live theatre, as far as I could see. It was one take for the actors. Unless something technically went wrong, you were on. You, you were straight on.